All right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, what's the kind of fortuitous to, to, to follow a talk on, uh, on promises? Because I'm going to be talking about reactive uh, programming and the sort of the step up from, from sort of getting you out of promise hell. So, yeah, I feel like our industry today has, the, the JavaScript industry, I mean, has sort of gotten itself into a bit of a problem. I mean, now we've got all these giant frameworks for, for writing applications like Ember and Angular and, and, and what else? Oh, yeah, React now has us apparently writing XML inside our, our code. And if you do an enterprise development, that sort of is starting to feel familiar, isn't it? So my problem with JavaScript today is that it is turning into enterprise development. And this is not a good thing. So I'm a functional programmer for the most part. And there's this thing missing from, from your regular enterprise um, development. There's everybody is doing it, for one thing. It does not make you feel special at all being an enterprise developer. This is obviously very, very, very bad if you want to be a good hipster. So this is why most of us are turning to functional programming as a platform for, for once again feeling superior to, to the common people. We have this wonderful vocabulary in, in functional programming that, that comes from uh, various branches of, of esoteric mathematics. Like in category theory, you have Cloisley arrows, you have your needle lemmas. I'm not sure what a your needle lemma is, but it sounds like you need one. Uh, yeah, the co-burritos, and of course the saga isomorphic prepromorphisms. If you're wondering what that is, by the way, it's just a prepromorphism with both zygomorphic and histomorphic properties. What's the problem? Yeah, so how to apply this to JavaScript, though? Because, I mean, in Haskell it's kind of obvious, because you need to use these words to, to even be accepted as a, as a Haskell developer. But in JavaScript, uh, the functional paradigm, even though JavaScript sort of is, or can be, a, fun a functional language, it's been missing for the most part. We're talking about callbacks now, but that's, like, that's kindergarten stuff for, for any discerning Haskell. So uh, there's this thing now called functional reactive programming. Actually, it's not called functional reactive programming. Um, the, uh, the creators of functional reactive programming are feeling very proprietary towards um, the name that they invented for it. And if it doesn't fit the, the definition exactly, um, you're not allowed to call it that. But we still sort of do. I, I think we should probably just be calling it reactive programming. In any case, what that is is, well, imagine uh, promises. And how many of you do note? Oh, a few. Staggeringly few. Uh, so there's this thing in a node called streams, and if you sort of marry promises and streams, you get reactive programming. Essentially, um, think of um, the observer, which is the, uh, the sort of the primary device of reactive programming, as a promise that will yield more than one value that would just potentially keep yielding values. So it's like a stream of values. Uh, there's this thing called reactive extensions, which just uh, recently appeared in the JavaScript um, world. It started, um, sort of came out of academia through Microsoft, as, as many things do. Um, it started at Microsoft, it started in C Sharp, and it's, it's since sort of grown out towards a lot of other languages, including JavaScript. Um, the particular inclination for JavaScript is called RxJS. Oh, let me introduce people, by the way. So this is Eric Meyer, who invented reactive extensions. And then, subsequently, it was ported to uh, JavaScript by his, I'm not sure if it's his, his colleague or henchman, Matt Podwizowski. And I don't think that's a picture of him, but <laughs> best I could do, short notice. Um, so we're going to be using RxJS today to, to write a little game to, to try and demonstrate um, why this thing might be a good idea. I'm not going to teach you about category theory or anything of that, but hopefully you'll see the point 
of, of this little exercise at least. So RxJS is what we're going to be using, and um, to do the rendering, there's this, um, there's this new thing called jQuery, which I think actually might replace prototype eventually, because it's really cool. You might have heard of it. <laughs> so it was written by this guy called John Resick, and that looks a little more like John Resick, to be honest. Um, so this is going to be our toolkit. You've got your jQuery, you've got your reactive extensions, and out of that, we are going to fashion a little game. First, I thought that I would give you a very brief demonstration of how um, reactive extensions actually works. So I mentioned the, the observer, and the observable, sorry. There are observers and observables, and the observer observes the observable. That makes sense, I guess. So essentially, we create an observable called ponies, and once again, think of it as a promise. And in this case, we have already fulfilled the promise with these values. So we can go, what you normally do to listen to what comes out of, of the observable is you would call the subscribe function and pass it a callback. Now, I have cheated a bit and now written a function called log, which will uh, log the outputs of the observable to the screen. So that gives us six ponies. You can only see four of them, but they are indeed there. So that's fair enough. That's, even promises can do this. Of course, they sort of work like arrays as well. So you can do things like if you want to make a statement about ponies, you can map a function over it before actually bugging it. Say, I love ponies. Oh, only one pony at a time. Think it greedy. So now you love ponies, as one should. Now, I'm not quite happy about this, because obviously there are some ponies here that I don't really love. So I can also apply filters, exactly the same as with arrays. It takes a function. Oh, notice, by the way, I am using ES6 here. There's no point in dwelling in the past, I think. So I've gone and just plugged in the tracer to, to help me go ES6. Actually, I think it's even ES7 now, because I'm going to be using array comprehensions, and I believe I just heard a rumor those are going to be delayed for ES6. So we are really in the future today. So I can apply a regular expression here to filter out only ponies ending with E, because obviously Fluttershy sucks. So we need to get her out of it. So now we've got um, Twilight Sparkle and Pinkie Pie, so we're getting close. Actually, let's just complete this. Filter things that end with pie. And now it looks right, doesn't it? Because obviously Pinkie Pie is the best pony. Um, but this isn't really anything that you can't do just with plain JavaScript arrays. Um, you've got this other thing that demonstrates the fact that this is indeed asynchronous a little better. There's an interval constructor, which essentially takes a, a number of milliseconds and will yield. Uh, every interval, in this case, every half second. So running that, see so that it just counts upwards every half second. Now this is going to go on forever, so I'm just going to move to the next slide. Shut it up. And we can combine it. Uh, the thing with, with reactive extensions is you've got a huge amount of, of um, ways to combine these uh, observables. Like the zip function, which Essentially, you give it a number of, of streams, and it will wait until each stream has, has yielded a, at least one value, at which point it will call this function that lets you pick which value you, you care about, or you could concatenate them or, or whatever, and it will then yield a, a value and then keep doing that, waiting until you have a new value from all the streams, and so on, which means that you can combine the interval with the ponies, just pick the ponies, and that should yield um, two ponies per second, which I feel is an adequate uh, tempo for ponies. So that looks legit. That's about one pony every half second. Of course, you can keep doing the same things. You can filter on this, um, map on this. Let's start with just the map, see if that works. So be more expressive about my feelings about ponies. 
every half second you love a pony. And if we filter it, now notice that the ponies are going to keep ticking every half second, but then we filter out the ponies we don't care about, ones we don't like. And this means that we won't see just two ponies with half seconds in between them. We are going to have to wait almost two seconds between Twilight and Pinkina. So, okay, I think that's an adequate demonstration. You realize now, I, I hope, that these are um, uh, streams of values happening asynchronously. So let us make a game out of this. The game I want to make is, so there's this game called uh, Robot Unicorn Attack, which I hope you've heard of. There's this robot unicorn running across the screen chasing dreams, and it has to, to navigate the, the train, it has to uh, dodge obstacles, and it has to catch things that are interesting to it, one presumes. So I'm going to skip the bit where you actually have terrain, because that is, we've only got about half an hour to do this. Um, so I'm, I'm going to put, um, obviously not a robot unicorn, but a proper earth pony uh, on the screen. She's going to run across um, an infinite um, stretch of terrain and there are going to be objects that she needs to collect and objects that she needs to avoid. And that is the extent of the game. So I've got some code written here already. This, because we are doing functional programming, I've written a very simple, um, not entirely efficient version of um, a persistent data structure. Essentially, I've got a function that, that copies objects and allows you to, to tweak them because once we pass an object on from, from the, the functions in that respond to uh, values from the streams, modifying them is a very bad idea. We want to have immutable objects. So I, sh I should probably freeze, freeze them and everything here, but let's not get too complicated. So here's a function that just lets me very simply test if a coordinate is on the screen. And this one creates a stream of um, key presses. I'm using the mousetrap library here to, to listen to key presses in, in a simple way. I, I can just go bind key space, and it's going to give me a stream of space key presses. Um, an Rx stream, as you might notice. So first of all, what we got on the right here is just essentially a body element. The body element has a background, which is the skies above Equestria, and I figure we should add the ground. So first of all, I'm going to have to get my body element. I'm going to call it the canvas. So using some jQuery magic here. Notice that this is so much better than prototype, because in prototype, this would just, you know, I want to select this by ID. And that's all you can do in jQuery. You can actually go like CSS selectors and shit. That is future. So, OK. That gets me the canvas. And I'm going to have to add the ground as a new element here. So div ID is ground. And actually, we can just go can't we? So like this makes it a little bit readable. Ah. You're jQuery experts, right? So if I do something wrong, these are the rules of, of live coding. It is on you to spot my mistake, OK? So you need to pay attention here. If you see me making a typo, if you see me just using this, this strange new jQuery library wrong, you let me know, OK? Because if this presentation goes down the drain, that is on you. <laughs> Don't laugh. I'm not kidding. OK, let's see if the ground appears. No. What am I doing wrong? I honestly have no idea. Let's do this my way. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. So let me create this element. That still doesn't work. It's probably off screen, isn't it? So let's see if we can make it appear. 
Actually, now I'm panicking. I'm just going to inspect this. Bear with me. Inspect. And there is indeed no element. OK, time to panic. If you've got any advice to offer, now, now would be a great time. Oh, there we are. That was strange. Right, so there's the ground. Whew. <laughs> Now, I did say uh, the podium was going to run across the ground, so I think perhaps we should make a move. So now let's get started with the Rx. So first of all, I'm going to have to write uh, my rendering function. I'm going to go with a convention where I have something like, um, I'm going to create an object to represent each, um, each item in the game. And the object is going to look like this. We need an ID that we can just pass to jQuery to help us find uh, the div that we want to manipulate. It's going to have classes. And I think we're going to default to classes being absent. And it's going to have an x and a y coordinate. So we're going to put the ground. Actually, I think it might also be a good idea to have base x and y coordinates. And then we can manipulate them in sort of our own little coordinate space. So uh, in this case, because the ground actually has an end texture and we don't want to see that, we're going to put it, offset it by 128 pixels on the x-axis. And base y, if it's zero, we just omit it. So x is zero and y is 384. So for every object in the game, I'm going to create a structure like this. And I'm going to write a function that will render that every frame. So function update element, which takes one of these nodes, and it goes all jQuery on it. First we find it, then we set the class on it, which is in node classes, as I said. Or if that's not present, then just set it to nothing essentially clear what might have been there. And then we set some California style sheets on this. Uh, left should reflect the x-coordinate. And of course, it's not just node.x. We're going to have to calculate the base x. Um, that would be node x plus node base x. Or if it's not present, then 0. And because these might be floating point values, because in JavaScript you don't have integers at all. Who needs integers? Um, we are going to have to uh, math.floor this. Or as I learned recently, there's this, there's this weird little trick that you can do that has the same effect. Essentially, binary or it with zero. That's going to drop the, the, the decimal part. And then we add px to this. And because JavaScript is wonderful, that means that it all gets converted to a string. And the same for top, for the y coordinate. So base y, and it should be the same, right? No comma there, or it won't work in Opera, will it? So essentially. This function should take one of our, our node objects and apply it to the div on screen. The div in question being the ground, first of all. And because we have more, more of these objects, I'm going to make a render scene function that renders the whole scene. And we're going to represent the whole scene with just a list, an array, essentially, of these nodes. So what? The only thing you need to do then is go for each on the list of, no oh, sorry, on the list of nodes with the update element function. You with me so far? Does this look reasonable? So we've sort of already written a game engine here. Um, so essentially, we should be able to call it uh, with a list containing just the ground. And it should work, and it looks exactly the same. It doesn't even show up. It's interesting. 
Shall we inspect again? There's nothing there. This frog is curious. There it is. It waits until I freak out and open the, the web inspector, and then it works. That's brilliant. I hope this isn't going to be a thing. Um, right, so now the ground is here. Let's test that is actually updating it by moving ground upwards. Or, you know, not rendering it at all. <laughs> this is new behavior. I like it. So apparently, it's, it's updating. So let's try and make a move. Just gonna keep refreshing until you see what I mean. So, and so instead of the ground, we're gonna have to make a, a stream of, of these ground nodes, and then uh, we pass that to render scene every frame. So you remember, uh, our friend interval. We're gonna go with a frame rate of, let's say, 30 frames per second, that's 33 milliseconds each. Uh, ground stream equals this, and we map a function over this. We don't really care about the incrementing value that you might remember, but Oh, actually, we do care about it, about it for this one because we can use it to move the ground. First of all, ID is ground, and base x is minus 128, as below, and y is going to be 384. The ground isn't going to move upwards, and the x is. X modulo 64, well, that means that every 64 ticks is going to loop back to zero. And multiply that by minus negative eight. This has been uh, arrived at through science. <laughs> or trial and error, at least. So that should give us a stream that, that moves the ground uh, sort of backwards uh, on the canvas. And then when it reaches a certain point, which happens to be exactly before the texture run, runs out, it will loop back and create the illusion of infinite movement. Um, so let's, let's render that. Now, what we would do, of course, is ground stream dot subscribe uh, render scene. What's the problem here? It takes an array. Well done. Good type checking. So what we need to do here, fortunately, Rx has everything. So we got a constructor called zip array, which takes any number of streams and turns them into a stream that yields an array of, of the values coming out of that stream. So. If we pass ground stream to it, which is the only one we have so far, and then subscribe that to render scene, it should work. At least I hope so, after a few refreshes. Oh, first one. So the ground is moving. Progress. Um, so we should probably get a pony there. This is where, where the game actually gets interesting. Uh, God, how much time do I have? I think we've got 20 minutes left. I think we might just make it in time. So copy the ground here. Let's put an arbitrary pony on here. I am not displaying any preference. It's just that Pinkie Pie is best pony. And let's see if there's an, oh look, there's a pony. So this is an animated GIF. It's a pronounced GIF, by the way. And, <laughs> and that's, a cheap way of, of making a game look realistic in this case. So I literally just put a, a div on there. There happens to be some, some California style sheets in the background doing magic, which essentially sets the, the background of the div to, to Pinkie Pie. Now, this is what we are going to introduce in game logic. So first of all, we need a physics engine. I'm going to write one right now. <laughs> 
is golf. So essentially, I'm going to add some, some items to my, to my game node. I'm going to put in um, two properties, Vx and Vy, which essentially describe uh, the, the node's current velocity. And then I have a, a velocity function that just moves the x and y accordingly. And this is where my immutable data structure library comes in. So the associate function takes um, the current object and the number of objects uh, that will be, well, first the current object gets copied and then um, the subsequent objects get merged into that. It's, it's, extension, it's essentially like uh, underscores extend function, except it also makes um, a copy. So we are, our modification isn't modifying the original object, which is very important to functional programming. So in this case, we are going to apply a change to the x, which is just going to be node.x added to node.vx. And likewise, for the y. So that updates the object according to its velocity. That's our physics engine. So, let's see, you would need a pinky screen. And actually, I'm going to create an object tick, which is our frame rate, which I can reuse. So I should be able to go tick here. Sorry, <laughs> this is too much JavaScript. Tick. And likewise, pinky goes tick. And here's a function you haven't seen yet, scan. It's sort of like a uh, reduce of arrays, except it yields intermediate results, which means that we can respond to the previous uh, value of the stream. So when something comes out of the stream, it gets run through the function that we pass this scan, and um, the next value is going to be what comes out of the scan function, uh, the function that, that we pass the scan, sorry. So this is a great place to put our game logic. Um, the first thing it takes, though, is uh, an initial value, which is going to be uh, one of our node objects. Oh, don't even know what happened there. Uh, hash pinky. And the base y puts pinky on the ground. And for science, I've determined this is 276 pixels exactly, which means that x Zero, she's not going to be moving uh, along the, the horizontal, so she's going to stay in x0. Initial y is going to be 0, which is going to be 276 in practice. Initial velocity, nothing. And that should do it. And then we pass a function that takes the previous value, let's call it p. And it's going to take the th thing that comes out of tick, which in this case we don't care about. We don't care. Okay. Uh, right. The first thing we do is call velocity, which also conveniently makes us a new P that we can modify to our heart's content, as long as we do it within this function. And so the first thing we do is apply gravity. Gravity is, sorry, p dot uh, vertical velocity plus equals, what's gravity? Gravity is 0.98, yes? I learned this in, in school, so it must be true. And finally, we just return p, so it gets rendered. And also, p 
please remind me to do this. I'm going to make it a point to make sure that if Pinky goes off screen, the game ends. So let's add Pinky stream here. And let's see if gravity is indeed applied. Oops. So we should make sure that she doesn't actually fall through solid objects. And the way to do that, of course, if she's actually below the ground, um, and she is moving downwards, then put her on the ground again and cancel her downwards velocity because the ground makes her stop. Come on, then. Do I have a typo? Training common. Oh, dear. Yeah, but that didn't break earlier, did it? It's lovely. It's just my... And if is not a function, that's very helpful. Really? But it just worked. On, uh, there, it's right there. And it did work just a minute ago, didn't it? Ah, there we go. <laughs> you see? This doesn't usually happen. I believe it's probably because, well, the only difference from previous talks is that I, know, I am now included the jQuery.js file in the HTML. <laughs> it's got to be something there. Right, so let's make her able to jump, shall we? Now, to do that, we can't just go listening to Tick. We are going to have to create ourselves. Actually, we're going to modify Tick a bit. This is where it gets interesting. So, Tick. I am going to make it bind key space. So when I press the space bar, I want her to, to jump. So the bind key function, as you might recall, uh, creates a stream of key presses. And I will buffer that through this interval. What this does is, now instead of an interval that just counts upwards, with a number, what we're going to get is an array of how many bind key events occurred in the interval, which means I'm going, going to get an array of zero or more space uh, strings, which is what comes out of the bind key stream. Uh, I'm going to get this continuously every uh, 33 milliseconds. So I can still use that as my frame counter. We don't actually, oh dear, I was hasty. We don't normally rely on uh, the tick value, but in this case we do, so I better put that back, just for the ground, because we needed to keep moving. Good catch, but it didn't. So, tick now. Actually, now I do care. Uh, tick is going to be our key presses. So, 10 minutes left, I better keep moving. So, if keys, if the first keys value, damn it, where do you go? If the first keys value is Space, oh my god, triple equals. I hope Douglas Crockford didn't see that. Then, oh, let's get that. So, how to make a jump. Now, gravity is being applied, so we should just be able to, to apply some upwards velocity to get her to, to jump and come back down again. Uh, minus 20 should do it. And indeed, it does. She can now jump, and jump, and jump, and jump, and she's up there somewhere. Ah. 
There we go. Right, so what's the problem here? I think she probably has to be on the ground if she's going to jump. So let's move that in there. And to make it especially exciting, because we have not done a sound check, let's see if we can get some sound out of this. Uh, Jump.mp3. This is not very functional because this is a side effect, but let's do it anyway. Yeah. You recognize it, do you? <laughs> okay. Now, one more thing before we move on to the obstacle. Actually, I think we're going to make um, something for her to catch first. Remember Peter Clausus? Now, if she's not on the ground, let us actually give her a different animation. Got some CSS for doing jumping, and then if she's in the ground, then keep going normally. So that gets us just another animation when she's jumping. Yay, okay. Quickly now. Uh, we're gonna add a coin that she's going to catch. So let's initial coin. ID coin, VX minus six, VY is zero, X is 1600, and Y is 40. So the idea here is that we create a coin node off screen at 1600 pixels, and it moves by six pixels per frame um, in pinkest direction. And we're going to have to make the note for that coin. And then we're not going to see anything until we actually get it moving. So let's make a coin stream. Now, pink is going to be able to affect the stream. So instead of just uh, starting with tick here, we're actually going to start with pinky stream, which means that we get pinky's position uh, as the argument passed in to the coin's uh, scan function which means that we can detect when Pinky actually touches the coin. Then the coin can react to that. Pinky stream, let's scan. Initial coin. Um, oh dear. So, and a function that takes the value of the coin and the value of Pinky. So, once again, apply velocity and using the on screen function. Now, what this does is quite simply restart it if it goes off screen. So, if we're still on screen, we, we return the value that we've been working on, otherwise, we return the initial value which will reset the position. And so we need to detect if Pinky touches it. So I am going to start it moving upwards when Pinky touches it. So it happens that checking that it has no upwards velocity is a good way of, of testing whether she actually has touched it or not. So if she hasn't touched it, and I got a function that I didn't show you called intersects, which is like a sort of good enough version of, of testing whether two objects intersect. And if pinky and the coin intersect, then first of all, most importantly, we play the most famous sound in the universe. You've heard it. And then, as I said, we stop the horizontal movement and start the coin moving upwards. And if it is moving upwards, then I want it to go faster and faster. So it sort of gains velocity. And to do that, we just multiply the current value with two every frame. 
So I think that should do it. Let's see. I think it still works at least. I've got some frame rate issues. Is there a coin? Of course not. Now what did I forget? I forgot to add the coin stream. This is getting to be a long line, but I don't care. So, is there going to be a coin? Yeah. And it works. Oh my God. Right, so I see that I have three minutes left, so I think I'm going to skip the, the obstacle or at least the implementation of it, because I, of course I have cheated and I got the complete uh, game code right here. So essentially the obstacle is the same thing, except that in this case, um, where Pinky affects the coin, but the coin doesn't affect, doesn't affect Pinky, it's the opposite way around. Uh, the obstacle uh, affects Pinky, but Pinky does not accept, um, affect the obstacle. What happens when Pinky touches the obstacle is of course game over. But the obstacle doesn't care, it just keeps moving. So the obstacle is a hater. Because as you know, on the internet, uh, ponies have trouble with people who don't understand why My Little Pony is so amazing. So there are haters on the internet. The game is about Pinky avoiding the haters. There's a hater right now. <laughs> and she avoids it quite neatly. There's some Dogecoin. <laughs> Uh, there's definitely nothing wrong with my, my computer today, but okay. And the hater, and of course if she... Okay, I'm, I'm too good at this game. I was going to show you the game over, but it's just reflexive. Yeah. There we go. So where's the hater? Come on, I'm not going to jump this time. Promise. There you go. Okay, so uh, quick notes. I've been using RxJS. That's where you find it on the internet. You can just Google RxJS, I suppose. Um, it's not the only reactive library out there. Of course, RxJS um, is essentially a Microsoft product. And as normally happens with Microsoft products, there's this guy in Finland who's created a quite decent alternative called BaconJS, which I feel like I should also mention. They're such a different. I would say RxJS is more feature complete, but Bacon, I think, for each function, it, it offers slightly uh, more power per function. It's a matter of taste, I suppose. Uh, finally, though, this one bears mentioning, because there is this compiled to JavaScript language called Elm, which is simply the most amazing thing in the world, and which has seriously inspired this talk. Um, which is actually built around the whole idea of, of uh, functional reactive programming. So there's a language and, and, um, and sort of a, a core library that is designed to do almost exactly the, the sort of thing that you've seen now. Elm is, you can think of it as, try to imagine if Haskell were designed by uh, a usability expert. It's really quite amazing and you should definitely check it out. And that was it for me. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> this editor I've been using, by the way, runs in the browser, and that is the location for it. And if you go to the GitHub thing, you get my notes with the complete game code as well. Yeah, I don't know if we have time for questions. If there are any. We are out of time, indeed. Just the time during the break, if you've got time, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've got questions for me, okay, then Okay, if you have questions, you can always come and ask. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.